Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale scratch built Cadillac Gauge M706 armor car. Since the last video update, I'm quite happy to announce that a ton of progress has been made to this model. Quite clearly, you'll notice that the vehicle suspension has been completed, painted, weathered, and fitted. And on top of that, you'll also notice that the wheels and tires have been assembled and mounted as well. We'll be going over all of the details that went into this model, bring it up to the way you see it here in this video. So stay tuned, grab some popcorn, sit back, because there's going to be a ton of content flying at you. Starting off, this video takes us directly to the rim drum mounts that we have here. Now, like what was mentioned in the last video, I went ahead and modified the detailing on both the front and the rear differentials, and you can see them over here. With the detail work on these now out of the way, the next area to focus on are these drums. These components here are what bridge the gap and connect the actual road wheel rim to the front or rear differential. The components that we have here are, again, 3D printed with the same black ABS material that was used on the two differential components. Although they look very similar and are basically the same size and have the same general appearance, they are indeed rear and front and specific. The two that I have over here are for the rear and these two fellows over here are for the front. The main difference is not necessarily the front portion as if I flip them over. Again, they look completely identical and this is by design, but the differences are obviously with the rear sections. The units that we have here with this extra board out section are for the front differential. And the front differential has this nub that emerges from the main housing. The reason why we need this on the front one has to do with the way the wheels are secured to these sections. They are going to be held on via a single M3 fastener. And the M3 is actually threaded directly into this material here. Now, because of the way the front section is with this domed out section, you need the extra material here on the front in order to get a good grip and secure bond of the threads onto the component. Otherwise, it will lead to itself being very weak because obviously you can't have any fasteners protruding into this section over here because it's going to interfere with the unit when it's turning. So we make up that difference by adding more material here to the front. In order to secure these to the front, here we have the front section. Now these ones here were modified from two rear ones. The actual production units will have this already pre-integrally printed on and it will be the appropriate size and shape. Anyway, so this here, the center hole is an eighth of an inch in diameter, which is the perfect size for an M3 fastener. The eighth of an inch is wide enough for the fastener to slide on in, but it's just slightly wide enough where the threads don't interfere and grab onto the walls of the drum. This section here is going to be, is, is actually tapped, so that the piece threads directly in place, and once on, it secures the unit to the piece, but in a way where it still allows the unit to fully rotate. So the modification was made to these two units here, but sadly I didn't get it on video. Basically what the procedure encompassed was me taking the largest size end mill that I had, mounting to my large capacity drill press, and boring out the center sections. Now the depth was set on the drill press to the appropriate height to prevent the bit from over drilling going further than it needs to be. This is obviously something that's less than ideal. Once the bit was done boring it out with a Dremel with a high speed removal bit. I removed the necessary amount of material so that the piece clears the center nub. Sadly, the hen mill that I had was slightly smaller than this section here. So just a small amount of material is required in order to get the right amount of material removed. Now on this unit here, the Dremel removed far too much material than I anticipated, which made it much more larger than it needed to be. But from testing it, it seems that this hole is not going to cause a problem and I can still fit the unit on, in place and it will hold it in a nice secure manner when, once the fastener gets added. So this is something that's going to definitely be seen as the build and video progresses. With the two front ones out of the way, this now takes to the ones in the rear. The rear ones obviously are going to be a lot more simplistic because you don't have those center 
holes to worry about, but the holes do have to be slightly enlarged from the original prints because they are slightly smaller than an eighth of an inch. So on the drill press, they're just gonna be drilled out. In addition to that, one modification that I make to all these sections here are with the faster locations found on the end here of the drum. This is actually the front portion of the drum and this is where the rims are going to be fastened to them. And in order to do that, it's gonna be just like the real unit where you have threaded rods which emerge from these sections here, the rim then slides on, and fasteners are used to secure the rim to the drum. This is done in almost the exact same method that I utilized on my SDKFZ222 build a number of years ago, and it was for a good reason because it yields for really good results. You have some nice accuracy with the way the fasteners are mounted on, and it does a really good job at keeping everything at bay. If you notice, or if anyone's ever watched that video, you'll see a similarity here with the way these are designed. On the back portion here, which buds up against these units, I have these extra holes that are bored in, which are not going to be visible once mounted. These are where I can add the M3 cap screws, which will mount on the inside portion over here, and then their threads will emerge. The reason why these have to be threaded is so that you just add the fastener, you just screw it into place with some Loctite, and you're not gonna have to worry about the piece falling out on you, or more importantly, when you mount on the rim, you're not gonna worry about the fastener spinning on you during the, the mounting procedure. So, in order to do that, I'm gonna have to enlarge these holes slightly, and then add the threads via the tap. Drilling the center holes out are pretty straightforward. Just use a drill press and it puts a nice straight hole directly through. Because the holes are already pre-existing, it's just gonna hog out the extra material required without there being a risk of the, the hole being canted. One thing I do wanna point out is that with the ABS plastic, it has a tendency to melt around the drill bit during the drilling because of the friction on the bit and on the material. And so in order to prevent that from or I should say to mitigate that as much as possible. Just like when you're drilling some other materials, a good shot or a squirt of WD-40 is gonna be plenty enough to keep the material cool and to keep the bit cutting away. So I'm just gonna spray some right in here. And with that out of the way, I could do the drilling. With the main hole drilled out, the next are to slightly widen the holes for the lug nuts. Now, the tap will go ahead and tap into these sections here, but it makes it a little bit easier if the holes are just a little bit wider. The size of the bit that I'm using is a 764 drill bit, which is smaller than the 1 8th, and it is just thin enough where the tap can cut threads into it and for the fastener to hold on. If you're going to tap holes for an M3. This size here is okay if you're going to try to do something with a medium type grip, but if you want to have something on a, with more strength, you want to go a size smaller than this. But for the application that we're using it for here, the 764 is perfectly suffice for the job. During the drilling, in order to, again, prevent the material from from melting any further. Just a shot of WD-40 on each of these little holes here is going to be used to keep the bit nice and cool. So. In order to cut the threads, I utilize my tap setup that I have here. I have my M3 tap and my miniature T-handle. Both of these are found on microfasteners.com. When it comes to cutting the threads, just like when you cut in metal, you want to have some lubricant in these sections here, which prolongs the life of the tap, prevents it from getting dull, also prevents it from breaking, but on the plastic over here prevents the friction from heating up the plastic, which can cause the threads to not cut properly or can cause them to just strip out. Yes, that is a thing. The friction, even for something this small, can 
occur for this type of a procedure. With a little squirt of WD-40, this definitely prevents this. Now, you have to pay attention when you're tapping into polymer because, again, you'll, you'll feel when the piece is having trouble. You'll start getting a little mushy on you, and if that happens, stop what you're doing, add a squirt of WD-40. This will cool down the material, and the piece will actually melt back onto the threads, which then will allow you to either go in or go out with the tap. So... From here, I'm just going to go ahead and give this guy a little shot. And I can just start the tapping process. Well, just like you just saw me conclude, I went ahead and drilled out the center portion here of each of the sides on the rear differential. The centers are going to be tapped because, again, the rear drum is going to be fastened to this section here with an M3 fastener. Before I go ahead and tap it, I just want to point out that for this section here, if you notice I'm using my larger capacity drill press, because of the length of this section here, trying to fit this on my standard drill press is just not going to work. So, I had to bust out the big boy for this one. Well, let me go ahead now and tap this fella out and... I'll get back to you once these sections are done. drill and tapping was concluded I went ahead and thoroughly washed these two sections here as well as the two end sections with some mineral spirits as well as denatured alcohol the purpose for that is to thoroughly wash off as much of the WD-40 residue as possible because these units are going to go into paint that material on the surface of these sections here is not going to be very beneficial when it comes time to add the layers of paint so you want to get as much if not all of it off as possible on the differential here it wasn't really a problem these units here seem a little slick still I'm not sure if that was just the material that these were printed in originally or if there's just some WD just permanently impregnated onto the surface, it's hard to say, but I'll get, I guess I'm going to find out momentarily once everything goes into its coat of primer and then its base coat. But rule of thumb is you want to get as much of that stuff off as possible. Jumping back momentarily to the hull, the last of the additions have been made and at this point here I can take the lower extremities out, get them primed, and in many locations painted. The last of the Additions were the welds that we have here on the corners. And I also added some welds to this little section over here. As we recall from the last video, in order to install and do the bodywork on this insert here, the original sculpt and welds had to have been removed. So with them now replaced, the lower hull, like I said before, is ready now for its next step. You can all see that the welds were added to these bump stop securing mounts in addition to the other locations that I mentioned. And once the primer is added, you can see just how much better everything looks now that it's all one uniform color as opposed to the different hodgepodge of colors as well as medias that were used to get the model up to the point here. If I go here, you can see, or actually you do not see the areas where I need to add the extra bodywork in order to flare in the inserts. Everything looks seamless, which is exactly the look 
that I was going for to mirror as much as possible the real unit. Another advantage that the model has at this point here is that I can look over these sections and find any sort of impurities that were missed during the bodywork phase due to everything being different colors. Namely, we can see this on these two areas here and here. This is going to need to be addressed before the model can progress any further, but that should be something that's fairly straightforward. And the other putties and sandpaper should make some pretty short work of it. While I was working on the bodywork in these two locations over here, I realized that there's something else that I should do to the lower hull at this point here before it progresses any further, and that has to do with the front and the rear plates. You see, with the way the V100s are assembled, the panels, or I should say the armored plates that comprise of the sides, are stamped and rolled to the shape that we have here, and then everything is welded together. Well, one of the attributes of this design are found on the front and rear, where you actually have the front plate slightly indented where it makes contact with the sides. If you look carefully at a real V100, you will see a lip or a seam found on these two front sections, and there are two matching sections found on the rear. Now, on the model here, of course, I'm going to implement this into the build because it is a bit of detailing that is found on this vehicle. Now, this bit of detailing was absent on the original hull that I worked on, so in order to add it, I'm going to be using this procedure here. It's a fairly simple one, but it's one that, once done, will really improve the look of the model. In order to give you the look of the indent, I'm just taking a small strip here of Plastruct square stock, and I'm gluing it to the front portion on either side. Obviously, I haven't got to this portion yet. Once the adhesives are fully set, the portion here on the side is going to be covered up and blended in with the bodywork. So that once everything is dry and sanded away, it's going to look absolutely seamless on this side here, but you're still going to have the inset found on this location. This will give you the illusion that the plates are assembled as they are on the real vehicle. And with the two strips now added to the front, you can see how it's beginning to fill in and really starting to pick up that look which is seen on the real vehicle. All I'm going to do now is add some red putty to the sides here in order just to blend it in. It's going to look a little ugly for a while, but once everything is fully dried, I can then polish it down with the sandpaper and it'll look nice and smooth.
With the sanding now out of the way, you can see that the sides here appear to be very, very smooth. And once the layers of paint go on, should yield for a seamless result. The bodywork was completed on all the three areas that I mentioned. And here you can see it on the rear. Once I go ahead and wipe off the remainder of the sanding dust that's left on the surface, I could then get the lower hull back into primer and then proceed to get the lower extremities with their base coat. Okay, take two. <laughs> you can see that the model now looks smoother compared to the way it was before. Note those locations that had that small little issue have been thoroughly blended away. And if we look at the rear section here, where I added those extra pieces that jut out on the side portion here, as predicted and as required, are completely smooth, but you do have that small little inset here found on both of the sections on the rear hull. And if I go to the front, you'll see the exact same type of procedure. From here, we'll play the waiting game. And as soon as the primer is completely dry, I'll be able to add the base coat to the selected areas that are necessary at this point of the build. Well, like I stated before, once the primer fully sets, it's now time to start adding the base coat to the lower extremities of the vehicle. For the base color, I'm utilizing this very dark shade Evolve Drab here. Now, this is the exact same shade and color that I use on several other 1960s and 1970s era of military vehicles, specifically for the US Army, that are showcased on the ECA channel. The paint itself is exterior latex, it's my own custom mix, and this is a type of technique that I've mentioned on several other of my build videos that are again showcased on this channel. For the application of the paint, on this one I'm gonna be using two procedures. First is going to be utilizing a paintbrush, and the paintbrush is really to get into these really tight spaces. So tight, in fact, that a airbrush cannot get in there. This is where the paintbrush is going to shine. Now, the paint itself is thoroughly diluted, so once the paint sets, it's going to be absolutely smooth, as if it was applied by the airbrush. Also, any areas that are exposed, the airbrush will just cover over anyway with the second coat. Now this method is exclusively being done on the inner wells over here of the transmission housings. Because of the way the plates are, you're going to be missing some areas of the paint if you just try to use and rely exclusively on the airbrush only. So that's when this fella here comes in handy. In order to apply the paint, I'm utilizing a fan brush, which is a great way, specifically in one six scale, because again, it evenly applies the paint in a nice thin manner. And because of its broad stroke type effect, it it's easier to blend and smooth everything over. Once this section is dry, then I'll go ahead and hit everything with the airbrush, which again should thoroughly coat everything and including giving this fella here a second coat.
After a second coat and a little bit of time later, we have the entire lower hull extremities now painted with its base coat. In addition to the base coat, I also added the weathering at this point for reasons that I've already stated. At this point here, I can start with the mounting or the permanent mounting, I should say, of the differentials. Before I go ahead and do, however, you can see the bump stops now mounted to the model. These were touched upon in the last video, but here you get to see what they look like now, fully painted and weathered and mounted in place. Along with the hull, I primed and painted all of the suspension components that were showcased in the last video. Here we have the differentials on the table. Here you can see what they look like now that they are painted in their solid color. This unit here is still awaiting to go into its weathering procedure, but this one here, the rear differential, the weathering has already been added and this guy here is now ready for installation. Here you can see what the piece looks like, fully weathered. And to compare and contrast it with the version that's still left in its original base coat. Note for the weathering, I used three types of methods. I dry brush, I use airbrushing, and I also use washes to achieve the look that you see here. Same is true also for the weathering that was just showcased on the lower portions of the hull. And the remainder of the vehicle is going to be painted basically the same way. On the transmission for the weathering, I went ahead and added some fluid seepage found on the following locations, including no most notably on the drain hole that we have here and on the bottom spout. And on this one, I went ahead and painted it brass as it was this material that I saw on the real V100 that I was studying. The last two things I'm going to add to the set prior to installation are the brake lines which come out of the top portion here. I already drilled a small little hole and the brake lines are going to run their uh, run their way along the stems here towards the top of the transmission. And I'm also going to be adding an extender to the drive shaft that we have here and that's what these two units are. When I test fit the transmission components to their wells, they fit in perfectly. However, the wall of the transmission bay is slightly longer, or I should say the drive shaft is slightly shorter than the wall itself, so there's a gap between these two locations. Although it's on the bottom of the vehicle, it's not really noticeable. It's one of those things that I just want to take care of at this point here, because I know it's eventually one of those things that will just eat me away. So in order to add the missing, or to cover the distance, I went ahead and tooled up these two Extenders, they're just nothing more than PVC tubes that have been machined to fit over the sleeve of the drive shaft. And these are, are spaced in a way that they make contact with the wall, eliminating that, that gap. The units are painted and weathered slightly different from the rest of the vehicle, which is just one way to add a little bit of color pop to the vehicle. Although again, these are going to be on an area that's not necessarily going to be very visible. differential has now been glued in place. Note the drive shaft extender that I was mentioning before and how it just goes all the way to the rear of the transmission well. From here I'm now going to add the brake lines which are going to be added to those locations that I mentioned before and once the glue is fully set I'm going to be adding a secondary mounting system because the glues alone will hold but in my opinion, it's probably a little bit on the weaker side, considering once the wheels go on with the rims and the 
hubs. That added weight might be a little bit too much for the super glue to hold in place. So I'm actually going to put a fastener through this location here and embed it into the 3D printed leaf spring. But I have to be careful because as we can recall on the rear leaf springs I went ahead and shortened them from the original printed version and to do that there is a steel rod running through the center portion of these two units. So when it comes time to mount the third fastener I have to be aware of that just to avoid any sort of other complications. And here's the front differential now past its weathering phase and at this point here it's ready for installation. I added the extra sleeve to this unit too in order for again to make contact with the wall of the transmission bay. The weathering is the same methods I use on the version for the rear. Unlike the version the rear of course this one does have steering. And you can see that. Now, over here, we have this clevis that descends downward from the front knuckle. This is going to hook up to the power steering mechanism, which will be mounted after not only this unit, but all the shock absorber components are fitted in place. So we'll be touching upon that momentarily. But from here, let's go ahead and get this one now fitted to the vehicle. <laughs>
Once the differentials and the shocks are mounted to the vehicle, the next area I'm going to focus on are the rim mounts. The rim mounts I showcased before, which are these two units over here. And since the last time I filmed them, you can see that they've been painted, weathered, and most importantly, their fasteners have been added. The fasteners thread directly into these locations here because if we can recall, I went ahead and added the threads via the tap in an earlier scene. With this method, you just literally screw the bolts directly in place until they bottom out. Since it's 3D printed, the bottom shelves are completely uniformed, and thus, once you're done with the fasteners, they should all have the exact same height. Once they are threaded in place, a drop of super glue is added to each of them just to keep them from loosening up, specifically when it comes time for the mounting of the nuts. Here we have one of the rims which I'll be touching upon momentarily. And you can see, once the unit slides into place, how it will then be able to be fastened to the rim mount. Once you find that sweet spot, you can see how the threads protrude from the rim. And when it comes time for mounting, I just take the M3 nuts and I just thread them in place, thus securing the rim and in turn the wheel to the rim mount that we have over here. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves because now that the fasteners are secured to the piece, we can permanently mount it to the differentials. To install the rim mounts to this model, first thing I'm going to do is take some super glue and add it to this small little hole over here. And normally I would use some Loctite for this, but regrettably I'm kind of out at the moment. So as a quick stopgap measure, the super glue for this application is perfectly fine. So I'm just going to inject some right in here. Perfect. Now we can recall these are tapped so that the threads should just line up with the fastener and keep everything in place. After the super glue is added, it's then time to prep the rim mount for installation. Here I have my M3 by 30 millimeter fastener. I have an M3 washer on it to make sure that it's going to grab onto the other washer in a nice controlled manner. The other washer is a standard pattern washer. It's larger in diameter, which means it's going to have some good coverage of this inside portion here. But because the hole is slightly larger than M3, that's why the other fastener is going to be used. So it slides into here like this. And then this whole unit gets slid into place like we have here. Note the recess found on this printer here specifically for mounting these components on with this method. And then finally, there's one more large fender washer that's going to be mounted in the back, and it's going to be sandwiched in between the differential and the rim mount. The reason why I do this is that it gives, or I should say one thing I've learned over the years building these models, is that if you have a washer added in between units like this, it really helps the component spin. And otherwise, the piece will actually be stiffer in place and will have more reluctancy to rotate. For the installation, I'm just going to line everything up and then just screw the component in place. And that's basically it. I could loosen it just a little bit because it's kind of tight right now, but a little turn or two should open up the tolerances. There we go. And you can see how the piece now can freely rotate. Note that it's on nice and true. It's not going to wobble or have any other lateral motion to it. Let me just tighten it a little bit. Once the CA sets, the fastener will be basically permanently held in place. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that when I rotate it, I'm going to move the camera so this you, you can see this from the face here because it's actually kind of important when you're doing some kind of installation like this. With the unit added, if I rotate it, you'll see that the washers are spinning, but the fastener is dead center and is it moving? This is what you want when you're doing this type of an assembly. It's far too easy to tighten to the point where the rims and the washers will actually stick to the fastener and if you're rotating it, the fastener can turn on you. If it turns, this is bad news because if you move in one direction, it's actually going to tighten the unit more towards the, the differential, which will eventually bottom out and even strip. Or if it goes in the other direction, it's just going to unthread itself and the unit will fall apart. So what you want is this type of setup that we have here, where the fasteners 
or I should say the single fastener is dead steady in place, but the washers have some rotation to it. And this is partially some of the reason why I have so many washers found in the front and also the one in the rear, because it, it lends itself better for this type of a, of a application. Well, with the one in the rear now done, I'm going to switch to the one in the front and mount those on. For the rim mount on the front, it's going to be using basically the same procedure, but with some differences because of the slightly different design found in this section here. Like I said before, because this one needs to pivot with steering, the design needed to compensate for the lost material back here for the, the well area where that turning knuckle ball is located. So for this one, I'm first going to add the super glue to the same section. I don't want to put too much in because if it oozes out too much when the fastener goes in, it's going to seize up back here where the turning knuckle is, and that's something that you really want to avoid. So with the piece now, or I should say with the glue added, here I have the turning knuckle, or I should say the, the front rim mount. And now on this one, rather than having that washer found on the center, I'm just going to stack up the washers here on the face where this section is going to make contact with this inner well here. Now off screen, I went ahead and played around with the amount of individual washers that I need to add in order to get the same spacing that's found with the one on the rear. And because this was done by myself when I mill this area out. It's slightly different compared to the one on the opposite side, which I already mounted on. So that's why this one's going to require a little bit more hand fitting compared to the one on the rear. Also, like I said before, on the actual production units, when these drop, this is not going to be something to worry about because this is going to be machined, or I should say integrally printed with the appropriate inner space well. So with that disclaimer out of the way, let me go ahead and start with the assembly. Okay, now Unlike the one in the rear where I had that longer fastener to secure the rim mount to the differential, for the one on the front, it's going to be a slightly different fastener, again, because of the shorter lengths. This one I'm going to be utilizing an M3 by 16 millimeter cap screw. However, the remainder of the washers are still exactly the same. Okay, so this should look exactly like the one on the rear. This guy here slides on, and there's three of these little washers that are going to be mounted in the back to act as the spacer. All right, since I already have the glue in place, I'm just going to go and thread this fella where he needs to be. Yep, and that's basically it. Just like with the one on the rear, the unit can fully rotate nice and freely. It's not inhibiting or any other type of interferences are found. And the washers are spinning, but the center fastener is not. So this here should be for a problem-free installation.